Greetings, ladies and metagents, and welcome to this narration of the web series, Very Clever Primates, taken from Reddit. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. I glared at Agent Brown, eyeing him in suspicion. Something was off about all of this. His sudden understanding of our language didn't make any sense. I'd spent over 100 Earth years in pursuit of knowledge. Study came very, very easily to one such as me. But this primitive was a youth even by his own species standard. How in the hells was he able to learn the complexities of an alien tongue so quickly? Furthermore, how was he able to even find our location? Was it the general sloppiness? I'm sure the human was reading the colors on my scales. A soft chuckle coming from his chest as he took off his sunglasses, placing them in his jacket pocket. I'm starting to think that you underestimate our capacity to adapt, Skolan, he said, those crystal blue eyes staring right into mine, his face utterly emotionless as per usual. Purely as someone who has studied our genome and physiology, you should know that humans can adapt to many different environments. We have people native to tundras and deserts, should it come as any surprise learning another language came quickly too? He asked. I shook my head. Agent Brown, I had the assistance of artificial intelligence guiding my study after thousands upon thousands of simulations, tests, and translations were run. You can't be too old for a human. Consider it my own innate curiosity getting the better of me. But I assume you had a lot of help yourself in order to not only learn my language, but also knowing our location and how to communicate with my high command without the general knowing. You humans have secrets within secrets, even from each other. If we're going to work together as a species, then it might be prudent not to be so secretive. I was half expecting some large monologue to erupt from the agent similar to how it did from the general when I pressed him for questions. Instead, I was met with only silence. The silence hung in the air for what felt like a full rotation, until, finally, the human's emotionless face broke, revealing an almost sympathetic smile, followed by a faint sigh. Yeah, yeah you're probably right, Skolan, he said, catching me quite off guard. Although I'd argue anything I'd say could be interpreted as a lie, I think that it would be pretty stupid of me to lie to one of the few aliens that aren't looking at humanity as a monster at the moment, he said, his eyes narrowing for a moment. Again, the general made sure that there was a huge pile of paperwork on my desk, kind of surprised he didn't get us blown up either. But I'm digressing, he said, standing up, stretching. Well, I'll start with me. My work for the United States government, kind of like the general... Though my career specialty is intelligence, he said, giving me a faint smile and a shrug of his shoulders. The second your ship arrived here, Escalon, my team and I went to work trying to find out how to broadcast to you. Turns out, General McCullum found your mess of a primitive signal first. The General's tackies over there did a pretty good job covering the tracks, proxies, private network, personal encryption codes. The General was planning this out for a long time, considering... The paranoid bastard already had a plan if aliens came to Earth, he said, laughing, shaking his head. Overall, though, it was a slip-up by my department. Wouldn't be the first time that we were slapped in the face, though. Can't tell you how many times our species almost broke out into nuclear war with fission-based warheads because our technology was moody that day, he muttered, causing my scales to turn an aghast blue from how bluntly and calmly he put that. Nuclear war was no jerking matter. As soon as nuclear potential was discovered by my own species, we shelved that technology in pursuit of less destructive sources of power. Technology, now that I was a bit apprehensive of discussing with the human that so casually put nuclear war. Regardless, once your giant mothership showed up at our doorstep and broadcast it to every receiver under the sun, it was pretty hard not to figure out where the general locked you up. Took us a few hours to get there, another few just to ensure the president would be safe when we arrived, and then another to scream at the boys in uniform to get them to admit where you were. 
There are some military operations that are hidden from the President's eyes, but I didn't tell you that, he said, smirking, walking over to the wall near me and leaning against it. I sighed, slowly discarding the fluffy white blanket that I was wrapped in as I sat up, looking over to the agent in irritation. Secrets within secrets. How does your government even run efficiently with so many secrets? I asked, my curls growing rigid, my scales glowing orange. You hide everything from your citizens, from your leaders. How do you even function not trusting people? I asked, genuinely curious and furious at the species. The agent only provided a quick laugh. Never trust anybody wearing a nicer suit than you. That's why I wear this one, the agent said, rubbing his eyes. I visibly cringed at the sight. So much bacteria was on his hands. How could he not fear for his health? Thankfully, the human didn't notice. Humanity is a mixed bag, if you'll pardon the expression. More often than not, you can give people the benefit of the doubt. Sadly, it's people like me that make things pretty rough for trusting others, he said, sighing, looking out the window. <sighs> Frankly, I really shouldn't be telling you any of this, but if you want my opinion, it's not like anything I'd tell you is going to matter anyway. The way our world runs is over. Make way for the space age. My irritation faded and my curiosity grew. I leaned forward on the bed to listen to what he was saying. What do you mean your world is over? It's not like we represent the end of your time of your species. You just know you aren't alone anymore. I stated plainly, perhaps a bit naively. I was spurring on the human. To put it simply, I just wanted to know more. I needed a second opinion on why humanity was the way it was. The cackle the agent provided was somewhat a shock, however. <laughs> There's a giant space station orbiting the planet right now. Aliens are at our doorstep. Petty things like this country said this and that country is planning that really doesn't mean anything anymore now that we know for sure that super fast space travel isn't just possible. There's already people doing it. People are starving out there, Scalon. How many Valans starve in the streets? He asked, raising his eyebrows. The color of my scales dimmed. It happens, but not often, I muttered. And when it does happen, it's due to the nature of the planet we're colonizing, not from negligence. We make absolutely sure all of our people are fed, clothed, and bathed. No one fails in Valan society. I replied, only causing the agent to laugh even harder. Oh, space communism! <laughs> Fascinating! He exclaimed. Communism? The humans clearly saw my confusion. A smirk residing on his face. Let me guess, your government distributes food, materials, and necessities amongst your people, right? Well, uh, yes, I stated. Based on what a colony needs, we try to send the necessary equipment and materials for survival as well as additional surplus, so that there is something to do other than work, I stated, somewhat proudly, causing the human to hum, his eyes squinting. And there are no disputes, no one tries to steal from anyone to have more, he asked. No colonies complaining about other colonies having more. If the colonies on one planet are having a rough time, do they get more supplies? If so, how do more stable colonies react to it? No, I replied plainly. There are criminals that are detained, but they are rehabilitated, and once we figure out what is wrong, we work to solve that person's issues to the point that they can function again in society. Every Valar knows that our species can only progress if we all work together for it. No individual is above another. They simply take more responsibilities as they grow more capable. Those responsibilities come with proper titles and recognition, I said with pride. Let me get this straight. You devote resources to one individual to make sure they get everything they need to succeed. No one takes advantage of that, he asked, pressing the issue. No Valon ever takes advantage of the generosity of their government to make out like a king. Not a single soul. My scales dimmed further. My shoulders sank. A few do, I said, sighing. But they are not, Balan. If it is decreed that they are true detriment to our society, they are made castless. The Valan have no failures. Rest assured, the statistics on those that are castless are slim to that they are erased. Agent Brown said, but not in a condescending or angry tone. 
despite the statement he unleashed. Every Valon is a worker bee, and your lead is a queen bee's. A defective bee is no good to the hive, he said, taking in a quick breath, raising his eyebrows. Again, human terminology was lost in me, but with the term hive, I got the impression he thought of us as mindless drones. He waved his hands. Your species is weird. It's understandable, but really bizarre for a species like us. Humanity wouldn't like it that much. We love your technology, but once they see your darker side, you'll be hated by a lot of people, he said. My scales burnt orange in irritation. So there is no chance for our species to get along? Are our mentalities so different? I asked, causing the agent to shrug his shoulders. Yes and no. If I had my guess, everyone's different. I personally don't see any problem with you guys. I think that we'd get along great, he said, smirking. Just letting you know, you can't please everyone. You'll be criticized no matter what you do. Especially since your society so closely resembles that dreaded communism on Earth. I have a solution to that, though, he said, tossing a pair of metallic objects into the air after retrieving them from his coat pocket, catching them midair. And what would that be? I asked, growing suspicious. It's hard to hate anyone that helps sick kids. Our Mother Mary's is a children's hospital close to our location, too. You already said that you wanted to help out the president's sick daughter. But why fix one little girl when there are plenty of other kids that could use a friendly alien making their lives better? Humans can be real scumbags. But get a couple bedridden kids walking again. I'm pretty sure you'll make some politicians and a certain general scramble to come up with reasons to hate you. Agent Brown said, walking towards the cream-colored door. You may need to get ready for some noise first, he said, chuckling. Why? I asked as he opened the door, leading to a wooden area surrounding a block of artificial stone with a few ground-based shuttles and other men in very impressive suits talking into small devices around the area. You'll be the first Valon to be introduced to the public. My people are working to make sure everything's secure. But there's going to be screams and shouting. We'll do everything in our power to keep you safe, Scalon. But there's going to be chaos. Can you handle a bunch of rowdy humans? He asked. My scales turned a bright yellow as I got out of bed, walking behind the human. I took a punch from a former partner of mine. I think I can manage some primitives, I said, humming in amusement. The human laughed in response, putting his sunglasses back on as he stepped outside. Even in space, hell has no fury like a... Wait, what was that a woman? It's hard to tell with your kind. You're clever, human. You figure it out, I said, following him outside and to the passenger side of his land shuttle. The height difference between the Valon and humanity was quite apparent. It was like trying to stuff myself into a can as I squeezed into the shuttle after opening the door. This shuttle did smell quite pleasant, though. Beard fecking aliens, he muttered taking safety harness from the side of the pilot seat and buckling it in before starting the engine. I jumped in my seat from the sheer volume of the Black Shuttle's engine. The sudden surprise reminded me of something, a question unanswered. Agent Brown, you never did tell me how you were able to learn our language so fast, I said, eyes squinting in suspicion, especially once he gave me a faint laugh and a grin in return. You're a clever alien, Scalon. You figure it out, he said, having the shuttle reverse from its parked position in front of the small building we were in before driving off on the paved road. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. I hope you all have a fantastic one. Cheers. I would just quickly like to give thanks to our Tier 5 members. Elithia, Barky, Feudicule, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Caspar Arnholtz, Albarden Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Lord Azrakal.